Let's continue our discussion of Longinus's work on the sublime. Uh, and I've added the Greek title here, Perihupsus, in case you're interested. Sometimes the Y is a U. It depends on how you spell it in English. Uh, but that's why I put that there, just so you know. Now, in this video, I'd like to talk about the problem of definition. How do we define the sublime? Uh, and as we'll see, part of the problem is that it's very difficult to define, and we tend to kind of go in circles. So if we start very broadly, uh, Longinus, when he talks about the sublime, he refers to it as a form of ecstasis. Okay, so ecstasis, which is related to our word ecstasy, though we shouldn't think of the drug here necessarily. Um, so ecstasis, this first little bit, ek means out of, okay, out of, and the last bit, stasis, means standing. The idea is that you're literally standing beside yourself as if you have some kind of outer body experience. That seems promising, but again and again with the sublime, we have to ask a follow-up question. Well, what leads to that? What makes you stand outside of yourself? Uh, and so we keep kind of going further back to look for causes, and it's hard to really pin this down. Um, another example he uses, he, he talks about a lightning bolt, and we've talked about this in a previous video. So the sublime is as sudden as a lightning bolt. It just hits you and boom, you are transformed. You're changed. Uh, well, how does this happen? It's a nice comparison, but other than the suddenness, we don't really have much to go on here in terms of what creates this power, right? The, the problem that we're dealing with, in other words, is what's often called a tautology. So a tautology tautology okay and if something is a tautology you can call it tautological or as I like to think of it toddler logical now a tautology is really a circular form of reasoning so let's draw a quick circle here if you call some oops arrow is not quite in the right spot uh, if you call something sublime there we go sublime right and then you try to define it and you say well the sublime is grand or elevated right then what you've done in a sense is you've given synonyms and we can extend these synonyms for a long time we can say well it's exceptional it's um, amazing it's awe-inspiring and so on and so forth but in a sense you're going in circles because you are kind of redefining the sublime with other words but you're not giving an exact definition and you can see this problem also in Longinus's definition uh, close to the top here where he says the sublime wherever it occurs consists in a certain loftiness and excellence of language well what is that loftiness what is that excellence we're really dealing with a receding horizon here because every time we say it is the sublime is this then we say well what is this right how do you define that uh, and that's kind of one of the difficulties that Longinus experiences in section two he comes at it from a slightly different angle and he talks about the difference between nature and art nature and art uh, this is an interesting distinction in part because you're gonna see it all the time in literary theory uh, when you jump ahead to the 17th and 18th centuries, you see this discussion all the time. Are the rules of art natural or are they artificial? Right? And if you are, for instance, on the nature side, then you might say, well, to create a sublime masterpiece, you need to be a kind of genius. You need to be a genius, and you're most likely born as a genius. Okay, so you're born as one and you can't uh, learn the rules kind of through book learning. So art would mean that you can find the rules uh, through a book, let's say, or by studying with a master. And if you're on the side of nature, then you say, no, this is actually just something you're born with, and you do it naturally, and there are no rules. Now, Longinus tries to kind of um, make these things come together a little bit so he says first of all nature is not entirely lawless okay so nature is not lawless 
there are some rules. <laughs> and then when it comes to art, he says, well, actually, if we think of where the rules of art come from, they tend to come from nature. So art teaches us, teaches us what is natural. And this is a wonderful solution because it basically says, well, art is natural. <laughs> art teaches you what is natural, and the two kind of coalesce into one. Uh, you're going to see this again and again. Alexander Pope tends to do this as well. Uh, but often there's, there's a slightly different emphasis, right, depending on the author. So for, for Alexander Pope, the rules, he really focuses on the rules. The rules tend to be natural. And then when you move to the romantics, let's say, they completely flip it on its head. And they say, well, nature is organic. And um, those organic rules, which are different for for every uh, creature, every plant, every tree, and so on. Those organic rules, those are the only rules we have. Um, that There you can see that this is not entirely a solution to our problem. <laughs> Does this help to define the sublime, to say, well, they're kind of natural and they're also part of art? Not necessarily. So after the second section, then, Longinus goes on to talk about what is not sublime, which is another solution. And we'll get to that in a moment. The other thing that he does is he tries to talk about both effects and causes. Okay, so effects, effects and causes. And it can be hard to kind of um, distinguish between them sometimes. So you think that Longinus is talking about the same thing all the time, but he actually switches back and forth. Early on, he's often talking about the effects of the sublime. So for instance, um, when we think about what the sublime does to us, we might say, well, it makes us feel exalted. So we feel exalted, wonderful feeling. Um, we also feel things like joy and pride in part because when we read a sublime work of art, we feel as if we had written it, as if we were the, the author. So it, there's this, a sense of identification with the process of writing. Um, we also feel ennobled, of course. Our soul feels enlarged. We feel more moral, perhaps. We feel elevated. Uh, and these types of works are memorable. Notice the one that Longinus does not include, that, that would be the persuasion aspect. The, the effect is not that we're persuaded of a particular view. That has to do with rhetoric, right? And Longinus is always careful to distinguish between the sublime and rhetoric, even though they share a lot of the poetic figures in common, uh, poetic metaphors and so on. They are not the same because the rhetoric is more premeditated, as we said in a previous video, and it's more about persuasion. Now, if we think about how useful this is, these effects, in terms of thinking then about defining the sublime, it doesn't help us much, does it? Because then we say, well, what makes us feel exalted? Why do we experience joy and pride? How are we ennobled? These are all wonderful things to say, but they don't give us a kind of formula. And that's the difficulty. If you were trying to create a book of rules about the sublime, it's almost impossible, because where do you start? The causes are more helpful, and this is section 8 in the text where he talks about the five causes of the sublime. But even there, you'll see that there's a bit of a receding horizon. So for instance, I'll just list a few of them here. If you think of grand thoughts, which is the first one, you have to be a great thinker in a sense, or have uh, a good soul, you have to be striving for nobility. Well what are these grand thoughts, right? What is nobility? How do we define these things? So it's a good criterion, uh, but it still kind of makes us ask some questions. Same thing with the second one, passionate language. Passionate language, what is passionate? Or the third one, uh, poetic figures. Yes, we need them but how can we tell when they're used properly and when are they used badly? So we have a couple more here, uh, but you kind of get the point, right? These are useful things, and we're getting closer, but we're still not quite there. 
And really the, the point of this video is just to demonstrate the, dif the difficulty of defining the sublime and why we often kind of feel like we're going in circles. Now, as mentioned, in sections 3 through 7, uh, Longinus deals quite a bit with what the sublime is not. Okay, so the sublime is not. And then he lists three things. So let's go through these fairly quickly and see if they help us as well. Uh, the first one is bombast. Bombast. And bombast is a kind of um, elevated language, but it sounds grand and yet it kind of falls flat. The example I like to give to students is that if you think of like a high school band trying to sound like a symphony orchestra, right? They're overdoing it. They're trying to play some classical piece of music and they're just not nailing it. It sounds grandiose and it sounds too over the top. So that's bombast. And if we draw a kind of diagram here, we can say that if we think of the sublime, the sublime moves us from what is ordinary to what is sublime, right? And then another form of this is where we kind of overshoot the mark and we get bombast and then it falls flat and the term for that falling flat is bathos, that's the term usually given which is the Greek word for depth so we kind of descend again and this is like an anticlimax, right? It doesn't quite come off. So bombast then overshoots the mark, doesn't work, and leads to bathos. Um, the, the description of this that Long, Longinus gives us is he calls this a kind of swelling, but not a good swelling. He compares this to dropsy. So dropsy is where you are retaining too much liquid, too much water in the body, and your body's kind of swollen. Think of like swollen ankles or something like that. That's not impressive. That's kind of disgusting. Okay, so bombast then is different from the sublime. Although you may be, may be wondering again, well, how can we tell the difference, right? <laughs> how do we know when somebody has overshot the mark? Maybe some people love that high school band playing like an orchestra. The second thing that is not sublime is what Longinus calls puerility. Puerility. And this word puerility comes from the Latin puer, which means boy. So puer, uh, the first four letters here, it means a kind of boyishness, childishness. And for Longinus, this occurs when people are showing off. Okay, showing off. If you are an author and you try to do too much. You have lots of metaphors, lots of similes. You just try to kind of pack your work with fireworks. Well, you're trying too hard in a sense, and he calls this frigid. It's cold. It's not, it doesn't have the right level of passion. Um, the opposite of this, and this is our last thing that the sublime is not, he, he refers to this as false sentiment. Okay, so false sentiment which is where you have too much emotion. And we can think of this as being melodramatic. Too sentimental, too much emotion, and it becomes sappy quite quickly. Again, this seems quite useful, uh, but the thing I want to point out here is that a lot of the description of what the sublime is not is actually very similar to what the sublime is. <laughs> and actually, at one point, he states this very clearly. Longinus writes, Those ornaments of style, those sublime and delightful images which contribute to success, are the foundation and the origin not only of excellence, but also of failure, which is really fascinating. And to demonstrate this, let, let me give you a few examples. So first of all, if we think of the sublime and the uh, what is not sublime, he refers to both as a kind of swelling. Both are a form of swelling. So how can we tell the difference between them? Secondly, he often talks about confused imagery. Confused imagery. 
where you have lots of metaphors together, let's say, and sometimes this is considered sublime and sometimes it's considered bombast. How can we tell the difference between these two, right? And then the last one here uh, is what we sometimes refer to as the deliberate mistake. Deliberate mistake. This is a really fascinating one. And actually, as you go on and you read more literary criticism, you'll see this one all the time. Critics love to do this, and it's kind of problematic. So what a deliberate mistake is, where it's where you're reading an author and something seems off. Something seems erroneous or problematic. And then you turn it around and you make a virtue out of it. So let me give you an example here. At one point, Longinus is talking about how Homer uses these two prepositions that he squeezes together into one word. And the new preposition that he creates is hupek, which means something like up out of. Okay, And he's using this to describe a storm. So this might seem bad. It might seem like Homer is forcing things, but this is what Longinus writes. Moreover, by his bold and forcible combination of prepositions of opposite meaning, he tortures his language to imitate the agony of the scene. In other words, he's describing a storm, he's describing terror, and it's as if the poet is getting carried away with his emotions, and he's so frightened and so impressed and in awe that he squeezes the words together to express the tension. Sounds grand, doesn't it? But how do you know that's what's happening? And how do you know that this is not an actual mistake instead of a deliberate mistake? And then one more example here. In section 22, he talks about a rhetorical device uh, or poetic figure called hyperbaton, which is where you mix up your words. The order of the words is not what we tend to associate with proper grammar. But the, here's how he describes it. By hyperbaton, we mean a transposition of words, right? So words are kind of transposed, they're moved in different directions. Or thoughts from their usual order bearing unmistakably the characteristic stamp of violent mental agitation. And then listen to how he describes this in, the, in what follows. It's as if he has, is trying to show himself how, how much he is affected by this emotion. In real life, we often see a man under the influence of rage or fear or indignation or beside himself with jealousy or with some other out of the interminable list of human passions begin a sentence and then swerve aside into some inconsequent parenthesis and then again double back to his original statement being borne with quick turns by his distress as though by a shifting wind, now this way, now that, and playing a thousand capricious variations on his words, his thoughts, and the natural order of his discourse. Right, that sounds pretty sublime, doesn't it? <laughs> or you could just say that somebody is uh, unable to speak properly and is making mistakes. <laughs> so which one is it? How can you tell the difference? Hopefully you've seen from this video the difficulty that Longinus faces, because often the very things that, are, that, that lead to bad writing are in the hands of a true craftsman, also the things that make for great writing.